Okay, hello everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's hard after, after lunch. People are uh, kind of tired, so I hope you uh, find this uh, presentation uh, helpful and, uh, and interesting. In the next hour or so, I'm going to talk about um, a reactive extension, uh, Rx in short. And, and I will explain why I think that it can make some of the things you do in your applications today much simpler and how it can improve the things that you are doing uh, in your daily jobs. How many of you have heard about reactive extension? Okay, like half and half. So, um, this is an introductory level talk. I'm going to start with the very basic and I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned along the way from using it uh, uh, all over the years. Um, I'm going to cover kind of all of the aspects that exist inside reactive extensions. So even if you know reactive extension, you might find some things new. So wh what is reactive extension? If I had to describe reactive extension in, in one sentence, then I would say to developers that they should embrace it because it's kind of the headache relief pill that uh, they can use whenever they need to start working with uh, events and asynchronous processing inside their applications. Now, what I mean by that is that um, um, when you have an application and you have all kind of uh, events coming into your application, all kind of sources that push data inside your application, everything looks nice at the beginning. You have an event, you somehow uh, handle that event, but suddenly you, you start to discover that um, the more events that you have, you need to add some kind of logic and some kind of state to start correlate between those events. And once you add that state, and let's say that some of your computation and some of your processing is being done concurrently, suddenly you understand that you need to somehow synchronize between the processing and protect the state that you have. And we all know that once we start adding synchronization into our application, we things start to happen. We have deadlocks and we have race conditions and all kind of mysterious bugs that starts to happen. And that's the point when you start to feel the headache. Right? This is the point where you say, oh, what have I done? How do I change it? What do I need to do? Uh, now, reactive extensions and the reactive programming that reactive extension is based on looks at the problems from a different perspective, from a different angle. And in, in this kind of uh, paradigm, we look at the domain as a set of changes that happen inside the application, inside the system. We have changes in the network when uh, we go into an area without reception. There are changes inside the logic. Uh, there are changes going on inside the text box on the screen, all kinds of changes. And reactive programming takes those changes and turns it into a first-class citizen and allows you to propagate those changes into some kind of a pipeline, building the logic in the pipeline that somehow is being fed from all those events and all those changes that is going on inside the application. Now, the best way for me to describe what I mean with this concept of propagation of change is by looking at your favorite kind of spreadsheet application, like Excel or, or Google Spreadsheet. In this kind of uh, application, you have cells and you have rows and you have columns, and inside the cell, you can put a fixed value, kind of a static value, or you can put formula. And the formulas are depending on some other cell or row or, or, or column. And the moment I change something in the dependent a, a column, like here, I'm, I'm adding more values into the sales column, automatically, the sales of the sum and the average are being automatically refreshed and recalculated. Now, for me as a, let's say, programmer, all I've done inside the formula, inside the column, is just saying that I need to depend on this other cell or another uh, a column. You see, in reactive programming, we don't look at variables like something that is a, 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 with a static value, with a fixed value. Instead, we try to look at those variables as things that has a value over time. In each point of time, I can take the value and build computations and build kind of formulas that are based on those variables. And whenever one of those variables change, automatically everything else is changed. The change is propagated on my formulas and inside the logic of my application. 
So, hello to everyone. Thank you to join. Uh, my name is Tamir Drescher. Uh, I work as a cloud division leader in Code Value. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I've been working with Reactive Extension ever since it came out, somewhere around uh, along uh, 2010. I've done a few systems that are based on Reactive Extension, and I learned quite a bit along the way. One of the things that I saw that many developers, when they start to work with Reactive Extension or even interested about it, they don't find enough material or they don't find enough examples to make it more concrete. And this is how my book, Rx.net in Action, was born, where I try to summarize and make, like, uh, pull more context into why you want to work with Reactive Extension in the .NET uh, uh, technology. So my Twitter handle is written above. Uh, make sure you follow me, and if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to share, and I'll be doing my best to, to help you. Besides consulting that we do in, in uh, Code Value, we also have a, a tool called OSCODE, which is a debugging extension for Visual Studio, which makes life really easier when you need to debug all kinds of complex problems. So make sure you go and uh, give it a try. It's really, really useful. So our agenda for today, I'm going to talk initially about um, the building blocks and the core concepts inside reactive extensions. A and these are the observables and observers that exist uh, inside Reactive Extension. Then I'm going to show you how can you create uh, observables inside application and how you can create all kinds of queries and pipelines that are based on those observables so you can have meaningful logic based on those uh, uh, building blocks. Finally, I'm going to discuss the concurrency model inside Reactive Extension, which is very, very powerful and can make a lot of difference when you work with uh, asynchronous processing and complex events. So basically, the whole deal with Reactive Extension is changing the way we look at application and changing the model. And in this case, we are changing the model to a push model. And the push model is based on this concept that we all know, the, 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 the uh, very famous design pattern, where we have a producer and a consumer. And there are very large amount of ways in which you can go and add this kind of producer-consumer inside applications. And everything looks OK at the beginning. We have uh, the producer, we have the consumer, they somehow interact, and my code does its job. And the more we add sources, producers to the application, and the more targets that we have, the more consumers that want to take it, then the problem became too complex for us to comprehend. So I'm going to start to take a, a simple application that is based on the, push, on the pool model, the, the same model that a lot of developers are using, and I'm going to discuss all kinds of problems that happens when you use that model. And from there, we're going to change and modify it to a push model that is based on Reactive Extension. So let's get started. Suppose you are given a task to add a feature to your application where you will have kind of a search uh, a feature that allows the user to enter some kind of a keyword, some kind of a hashtag. And the application will go to all kind of different social network and try to search in those social networks and receive the values and show them on the screen for the user. Pretty simple. So a lot of developers will write something that looks pretty much like this. We have a method called load messages, which accepts the string of the hashtag. And this method will return some collection that holds all the results from the searches that we do. Inside the method, we are going one by one to each one of the social networks through a designated client. We have a Facebook client, we have a Twitter client, a LinkedIn client. We do the search in each one of them, get the results, and then combine it together to a combined collection. And we return it. Right? Has anyone ever written something that looks like this? No one. Excellent. <laughs> so there's a few problems in this kind of sequential model as it is now. First of all, as we all know, this is a blocking method, right? If I'm writing a UI application and some code in my UI is calling this method, the UI thread will be blocked. OK, so you can say, I don't want to block my users. Let's add a sync and await. OK, this is better, right? This is kind of the sync and await 
kind uh, of method. I've changed my method signature. It's now uh, renamed to add a async uh, a suffix. And it returned a task of binomial, and every one of the searches is being done in an asynchronous way with the await. Great. Now suppose everything works OK on your machine, and on your machine, the time it gets to take those values from each one of the social networks is negligible. Right? Let's say it takes, I don't know, one millisecond. And then you go to another country, and for some reason in that country, one of those sources is blocked. And now the time it takes to return the, the result is longer than the one you expected, right? And you can't really know in advance where it will happen and in which one of the social networks. And in some places it might fail because it's blocked. In some places you might have a long latency and therefore the time the user will have to wait until you see a single result on the screen is the time that is the sum of all those a, a operation taking place. Let's say that Facebook will take, I don't know, 20 seconds to return a result. The user will only see a result on the screen after these 20 minutes, 20 seconds or more. Okay, so you can say we can do better. Why not do something like that, right? Do the searches all in kind of concurrent way and then let's combine them when all the searches have completed. Okay, so now it will take less time than the sum of all the times, but you will still have to wait for the longest of the operations until anything will be displayed on the screen. And let's say Facebook is taking 20 seconds to return a result. It's not like that I can show the trader results in this way to on the screen once it is completed. So again, it's better than what we had before, but it doesn't solve the main core problem in which I want responsiveness in my application. I want to react to the results as soon as they are there. Another approach might be using an iterator with yield return. Okay, so now I can really show something on the screen when it's there, but as of this time, we can't include both asynchronous operation with a sync await and yield return. So basically, we are back to square one. I'm not sure which one of my sources will complete first, so I don't know how to write it in a way that will return something to the user. Now, the main problem that we had here is this I enumerable. And the reason is that with I enumerable, basically, you give the control to the client that received the I enumerable. And this client, in his own pace, will go and iterate on this collection. Once you put this kind of control in the client side, you kind of blocked yourself from making any kind of changes because you must return this instance of the I enumerable and the, the control that is inside the client might be blocked because while it is iterating, I might waiting inside my code, like in this yield return, to some result to come back. So the client is not really free to do his operations while some processing is being done in the back. What we really wanted is something that looks like this. Whenever I'm doing a search, the moment I have the results, it's being pushed into the client to this kind of, uh, let's say, screen, and it's being shown there at the moment it is available. So one way we can achieve this kind of behavior is by using events, right? Regular .NET events. In this case, let's say I'm going to implement it by myself. I'm creating a new class. I'm calling it Social Network Manager. Now, this class exposes an event called Message Available. And it has the method load messages, only that now, whenever we have a result, and let's say that I can now use the async await inside, whenever I have any results from the social network, I can just raise the event and hopefully someone on the other side that was subscribed to the event will receive it and work with the value. So the client side is going to first create the social network manager and then subscribe to the event with, in this case, a Lambda expression. And inside the Lambda expression, we are specifying that for each value that was raised on the event, we do some kind of processing. And after we subscribed, we call the load messages with some key, with some value. Okay, so now 
I did get to the point that I can show and, and, and push the values the moment they are available, but there are a few problems that exist in this kind of code when we are using events. First of all, subscribing to event is, let's say, something tricky. As a developers, we want to write simple code. We want to write short code. We want to write something that is nice for us to code. So we write something like this with lambda expression. But the thing is with uh, uh, events that subscribing, subscribing is easy, but unsubscribing is not that much. You don't have a really good way to unsubscribe a lambda expression that was subscribed to the event. Because for unsubscribing, you must have an instance of a delegate. But the Lambda expression created this delegate behind the scenes. I don't have access to it. So you can go and do some tricks. You can store the Lambda expression inside a variable, subscribe the variable, and then unsubscribe the variable when you're done. But then the code looks funny. You can, of course, go and just take the whole method that I wrote inside this Lambda expression into a member, a, a, a method inside my class. But now, you will start having islands of code spread inside your application, inside your class, and you can't really reason about and understand the flow that is going on inside your application. So this is the first problem. And events that are not being unsubscribed are the main source for memory leaks and the main source for all kinds of weird bugs that happening because something happened in one place but you forgot to unsubscribe, so you got those events in another place that you didn't expect and it's hard to go and find those bugs in, in, in production. The second problem is that subscribing to event in this kind of way is not composable. What I mean by that is that I can't add new logic without going and change the event handler. Let's say I want to handle only specific messages. I want to add a filter. There is no way to put something between this event handler and the event source and just do the filtering in the middle. I have to go and change the code inside my event handler and add an if. And let's say I want to do some kind of uh, transformation. I want to take the values of those messages and maybe uppercase them or somehow anonymize some of the values inside. Again, I will have to go to the event handler and I have to change the code. I can't compose the logic that I want by adding all those pieces to compose a single uh, um, logic. Another problem is that events in .NET are not first-class citizens. What this means is that I can't take an event and just send it as an argument to a method. Let's say I want to subscribe to events in a sp specific place, and I want to get the instance of the event to subscribe to. There's no way to do that. I have to maybe create a new interface that declare this interface, this uh, event, and make the class that expose the event implement this interface. But then, what if I want to register, I want to subscribe to events that give me strings? No matter what kind of class offers this kind of event that uh, uh, provide me strings, I can't do that in an easy way. And I don't want to go and implement the same interface in many kind of classes that has no relation to one another. So again, this is kind of a problem if I want to reuse some code that does registration on events. And finally, there is no isolation when we work like this. If somewhere else inside my application, I get a hold of this instance of the social network manager, and I will do another load messages call, the code that I have here will also get those messages. But I only wanted to receive messages that include the keyword Rx, right? So maintaining this kind of separation where you will create an instance of the social network manager in each place, then subscribe to it and then run the operation is a source of problems because you can't really know what will happen the next day, who will take the instance and will do something that will affect the code that you have already written. So this is not good enough. So again, we wanted to achieve this kind of model where we have an application, is doing something, and the values are being pushed into the client ongoing. So the question is, what do I return? What can I put inside these question marks that will give me this kind of behavior? Luckily, 
We have such types that already exist inside the .NET framework ever since .NET Framework 4.0 that we can use. The first one is called iObservable. And an iObservable has a single method called subscribe, which receives something called iObserver. The iObservable is the producer in the role that we are trying to achieve, right? We have the producer and the consumer. iObservable is the kind of the producer. And the second part, the other role, is the observer, which is the consumer. And you can see that the iObservable accepts an observer inside its subscribe method. Now, between those two elements, there's a special connection and there's a special protocol between them, which goes something like that. We have an observable and we have an observer. Everything starts when the application is executing the subscribe method on the observable and passing the observer that wants to subscribe. When this is happening, we get back an object. This object is the subscription, which implements an iDisposable. Whenever I want to disconnect between the observer and the observable, all I need to do is just dispose this subscription, which is really good for us from the resource management kind of uh, uh, way. Because I can take this object now, and I can store it inside a member. I can pass it along to another place. I can combine it with other disposables. I can write a disposable pattern inside my class. I can do a lot of things that we already know to do and make sure that I won't have this kind of leaking subscribers inside my application. It also gives us the benefit that I don't need to know who exactly is the observer, who exactly is the subscriber when I want to dispose, because iDisposable is just an interface for disposing things. I don't really need to know what is the object, unlike events, where I have to know exactly what was being subscribed. OK, once we have an observer that was subscribed to an observable, the observable can start pushing and notifying on kind of values and changes and events that are happening. So visually, in the Rx world, we use a special uh, diagram to explain. And this is called the marble diagram. In this diagram, we show the observable as a line. The line specifies the lifetime of the observable. And so when an observable wants to notify its observers on something, it's calling the onNext method on those observers. And we show that notification in the marble diagram using a marble with a value, this kind of a circle. An observable can notify once. It can notify multiple times, infinite times. And we will show those values on the marble diagram. And in marble diagram, there is no real meaning to the, the distance between two marbles. But we usually say that if the distance is longer, it means it took more time until we get the value. And of course, observable might not raise anything. We can have an observable that never notifies on anything because nothing ever happened. Now, observable can also notify its observers that it is being completed, meaning no more notification will be pushed to the observers. This is something you don't have in events right now. You can never know from events when it is going to be the end. Unless you have another event that will notify you that another thing is uh, uh, finished, you don't have this kind of power in your hands. But observables can notify the observers that it was completed. And this also, behind the scene, disconnects between the observer and the observable. You see, unlike events that I must go and unsubscribe, in this case, the observable can also unsubscribe the observer when it has nothing more to, to notify. In the very same way, an observable can notify its observers that something bad happened, some kind of error has happened inside the observable and the logic that was inside. And we show this uh, error uh, notification as an X on the observable line in the marble diagram. And the uncompleted is shown as a vertical line that says, this is the stop. Here we finished. Great. So, I know it sounds like, why do we need to know all this kind of protocol? Do I need to do it all by myself? So the answer is no. I want you to understand what's going on behind the scenes, because I think it's important to understand what you're working on. But 
Namely, you don't really need to understand and do those things by yourself. You see, the .NET framework includes the iObservable and iObserver interface, but they are just interfaces. There are no implementations existing inside the .NET framework. Instead, to get all this power of reactive extension and getting all the tools that allow you to make use of it without writing your own observables and observers, you need to install a single package, which is the system.reactive package. This is the main package for reactive extensions. There are other packages, but once you install system.reactive, it will know what needs to be installed in your kind of project. And in most cases, you just need to install the system.reactive. This is the access point to get all the power of reactive extension, the tools, the operators, the logic that it can provide. So how do we change the example from before to what we need now? So I'm changing the class that I written before, this social network manager, and I've added the word reactive to make sure everybody understands this is the reactive style of programming. Now, instead of load messages, I've renamed my method to observe messages. And this is kind of a convention we like to use in the reactive world to uh, uh, make it clear that this is in a uh, reactive way. And instead of returning I enumerable, I now return I observable, which is kind of saying I'm returning a collection of values that are changing over time, right? In the very same way as you return an I enumerable. Okay, cool. Now my client on the other side, the one that wants to consume those values, will create an instance of this reactive social network manager, or maybe it got this instance in dependency injection or something else, and it will call the observed messages with the search key term it wants to search, and will use one of the uh, operators and one of the functions we get inside the system.reactive package which is called the subscribe, only I don't need to pass an observer instance. Instead, I'm getting kind of an, uh, if you like, an observer factory, where I just specify what I want to do in each one of those reaction functions. The first one in the subscribe is the on next. Whenever there's a value, whenever there's a notification, I will receive it as a message that you see here, and I will just call the console write line. Okay, this is the on next. If there is an error, something bad happened, I receive the exception and I can do some kind of logic to, uh, uh, to uh, somehow fix it and do something useful with it. And if the observable is completed, I just know and be notified and can do something else with it. So this is the client side. The nice thing about it is that now you have everything that is related to this kind of search session in one place. Unlike events, where usually you will get the event handler located in, in somewhere that is different than the place of the event source that has created it, you have everything in one place. And of course, the subscribe method returns the I disposable that I can then use to store somewhere in my class and dispose it when I don't want to receive any more things. Right? And, and of course, if the observable has finished and notified me with the uncompleted, the connection was disconnected for me. I don't need to do anything else. Okay, so now I've shown you how the reactive approach will look like in this kind of uh, class. So the question now is, how do I implement these observed messages? How do I create those observables? And this is the next part of this uh, presentation. So let's look first at a single social network client. Let's say the Facebook, okay? You remember my application wants to go to a various sources, a various social networks. Let's consider now a single one of them. So we have these observed messages in the Facebook client. It looks the same way as before. We get the string and it returns I observable. The first thing I can do is writing something that looks like this. I can use the observable factory method called create, which is uh, uh, provided to me inside the static class called observable. And this is the observable static class provide a large amount of operators and, and tools that you can use. And one of them is the create. The create receive the subscribe function. If you remember, observable provide a subscription. 
I can subscribe to an observable. And so I provide to this observable create what I want to happen whenever an observer is subscribed to this uh, uh, observable. And of course, I can pass an async method. So now, every time observers subscribe to the observable that is created by this method, this code will be ran. And in this case, I'm just going, and I fetch the values from the Facebook, in this case, in an asynchronous way, iterate on this collection of values that I got back. For each one of those messages, I just call the on next on this observer. And when I'm done, I'm just saying to this observer, completed. That's it. I'm done. Of course, I can also add kind of error handling. And if something bad happened, I can notify the observer. But to keep it short, I didn't put it here. OK, this is nice. It really takes this kind of pull model and turn it into a push model. But do I really need to do it each time I want to take a collection and create an observable from it? And of course, because this is something that happens a lot, we have given from the system.reactive package another tool, another conversion operator. In this case, I can just take any collection and just create an observable from it, right? So the same code, I'm going and I'm fetching the values from uh, this social network with an asynchronous method, and then I'm just converting this collection into an observable, and that's it, right? So we have given a lot of tools to make this kind of change of models. But there is a problem in what I'm showing you here. The problem is that this observable that I'm returning, whenever some observer subscribes to it, it will receive the same collection of messages. Why? Right? Because I'm taking a collection that I'm taking from the get messages async, and I'm converting it into an observable. But it can be sometimes going between the time I'm calling those observe messages method and the time that an observer is subscribing. In that period of time, something might change. What I want is kind of a lazy evaluation. I want that when the observer is subscribing, then I want to go and fetch a fresh copy of the messages. Right? So we have solution for that too. All I need to do is use another operator called defer. And defer defers the execution to the moment the observer subscribes to the observable. But inside the defer, I can use other observables. So I get this kind of nice way to reuse code that I already have. Now, this kind of problems inside application is not new. And I can even share with you that inside Azure, this kind of problem of not using defer has caused a, an outage in one of the data centers. You see, in Azure, there was some point that they needed to go and fetch the collection of all the DNS servers. So they used an observable to do that, but they created the observable from the list of those DNS servers, but there was some time between creating this observable and subscribing to it. In that period of time, those DNS servers have changed. So the solution was, and they talk about it in one of their uh, in one of their presentation, is to wrap the code in defer. And what will happen here is that once an observer is subscribed, the code will go and run the uh, code inside my defer. It will create the collection of messages and the observable from it. And now the observer will be subscribed to this collection. So we will get a fresh copy of messages each time the observer subscribes. Cool. So now, let's say I've done it to the Facebook client, to the Twitter client, to the LinkedIn, and whatever social networks that I want. I want to combine all those values together. And of course, I want to receive the notification the moment they are available, no matter from which one of the social networks. All I need to do is use the observable.merge, which is an operator that merge observables. And if Twitter is faster than Facebook, this observer will receive the messages from Twitter as they are available. And if in another place LinkedIn is faster, then we get the values from LinkedIn. And I, haven't, I, I don't need to do a much to add a new kind of social network. All I need to do is to add it to the merge, which I can, of course, do dynamically. So this is one way we can go and create observables. There are other factories that exist inside for all kinds of tasks that 
are common to developers. For example, I have the range operator that allows me to create observable with a range of values, uh, like in this case from 1 to 10. Another thing that I can do is to add the element of time, because observable are values over time. So the observable.interval is an operator that will create a notification on the observable with a time span that I specify. In this case, every second, a value will be pushed from the observable to the observers. And, um, and in this way, I can start building all kinds of applications, all kinds of logics that depends on time-related uh, time issues. Of course, events are not gone, and they exist inside the .NET framework in a lot of places. But it's very, very easy to convert them into observables. So in this case, I can just take an observable dot from event pattern. It's an operator that allows me to take existing events and convert them into observables. A, a send the instance of the object that include the event and the name of the event. There are other overloads, but this is the simplest one. And that's it. Whenever the event is raised from this search box, which is a type of the text box, I will get a notification on the observable, which is really powerful can I, because I can take existing code and just add the layer of observables uh, on it without making a lot of changes. So now we have observables, and we know how to subscribe to them. But the main power inside Reactive Extension is that we can create a pipeline and queries over observables. You see, many times Reactive Extension is being referred to as link to events, which means that I can use whatever I know from link, and instead of doing it on collection that has a fixed collection of values, I can do it on observables that has values that are changing over time. And I can do filtering, I can do transformation, I can add time-based operations. And so there are many, many types of operators inside Reactive Extension far too much for me to really show you here in this single uh, uh, presentation. So, but I want to show you one specific example that I think really shows what is the power of reactive extension. So what we're going to do is create this kind of feature, which is the reactive search. In this feature, I'm, done, I'm going to add a, a search inside my application that the moment the user types something, it will show the results. It will go in search and show the results on the screen something similar to what you have here. Now, there are a few rules that I want to add. First of all, I don't want to search uh, uh, short strings. I want the string to have at least three characters in order for me to search for them. I don't want to overflow the server, so if the user is ticking really, 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 really fast, I don't want to send a search for each one of the ticks. I want to wait a small period of time before I will send it. So only after the user has completed writing, then I will uh, search the value. Of course, if the user writes something and then change it and very quickly delete the change so it's back to the original search, I don't need to search again, right? Because I will get the same results. So I don't want to search the same string twice if it's one after the other. And finally, and this is interesting because I want you to think about how you would do it inside your applications. Suppose the user stopped typing, and we are doing a search that was sent to the server. And then it takes a while until the results came back, because, I don't know, something happened in my network, and the results are not there. And while I'm waiting for those results, the user has changed the value, and another search was sent. And in this case, let's say the second search is faster. So I got the results back. But I have this search that I initially created, and now I'm getting the results of the first search after I already displayed the results of the second one, right? So I don't want to have this kind of bug inside my application. I want to always take the results of the last search that I sent, even though I can get results from previous searches along the way. So let's see this in action. OK. So I've created a small application. Let's run it. And in order for you to show that it uh, really does what I said it needs to do, 
I've added the Fiddler on this side. So in Fiddler, we will see each time a request is sent to the server. So, of course, like I said, the first thing I want to enable is that only searches that are at least three characters will be sent. So let's say I'm writing R, nothing is sent. You can see inside Fiddler, nothing shows up. So let's search something here, RE, still less than three characters. Let's add another character. Okay, we got results. So we know that my implementation does enforce that at least three characters. And we can see here that some search was sent to the server with the value. Now, I said that I don't want to make the search if I'm typing really, really fast. So let's write something. And you see that although I've changed the text with few characters, only the last one, which is reactive, was the one that was sent to the search server. Finally, I've added a special value that takes a while until it completes. So you can see here, let me do that again. You see, React1 takes a while until the results are back. Here, we got it now. So again, let's say I want to search for something, and I'm doing the search for React1, and before the results are back, I'm changing and showing something else. Right? So here, React1, and then React. So we got the result from React, and now I've got the React1, but it hasn't changed the values that I see inside the result screen. So how did I do that? So first of all, and I'm not showing it here, but I installed the system.reactive package. Now, the first thing I need to do is create an observable. And I already have in this, this is a WPF application just for the demonstration. And I already created this search box inside my application. So now, all I need to do is use the observable dot, uh, dot, dot from event pattern. I will pass the search box, which is the text box that I want to use, and the name of the event in the search box that I want to listen to, which is the text change. Beautiful. So now, if we look, we will see that I got back from this method an I observable of something. And it doesn't really matter what is this something, because the text change event args, surprisingly, does not include the text of the text box. So it doesn't really give me anything useful. So what I want to do now is for every time I have a notification of the text uh, that was changed, I want to go and text the value from the text box. So I will use the select operator, and I'm going to take the value from the search box dot text. Okay? Just like you do in regular link. If we look now what is the type that we got back, it's an I observable of string. Beautiful. Every time the text changed, I'm going and taking the value from the search box, and I'm pushing it on the pipeline. So I have an observable of strings. Now, the next thing I told you that I want to do is that I want to go and search only texts that are at least three characters long. So I want to add a filter using the where operator. So I'm going to take the text, and I want to make sure the text length is greater than two, at least two characters, right? Because this is a filter, the value of the observable, the type of the observable is still I observable of string. Great. Now, I've said that I don't want to search for the string if there's not enough time that has passed between two uh, uh, text that was given to me, right? If the user is clicking really, really fast. Basically, you can think about it like a bus waiting in a bus station. As long as passengers are going on the bus, the bus stays in the station. But if there's some period of time that no passenger went on the bus, the bus can go to the next station, right? So to do this kind of logic, we use a special operator called throttle. And yes, I know that the name doesn't really mean enough, 
uh, means something that we can understand, but the point in throttle is doing this exact logic. It's waiting and not allowing the value to push forward until some time span has passed. And I need to specify what is the time span I want to wait. And in this case, let's say it's half a second. So right now, I have something. It's still I observable of strings that will only allow values to proceed if half a second has passed since the last value that was emitted. So now I can finally, oh, almost, now I want to make sure that I won't search for two strings if they are the same one, one after the other, right? So this is kind of a variation of distinct. And in this case, I'm using the operator distinct until change, which does exactly that. It will distinct values, but if the value changes from the previous value, then we allow it to proceed. Now I can really go and make the search. So to make the search, I'm going to use I'm going to use a client that I've written. Right? It's just an HTTP client. And I'm going to call the search async and pass the string that I want to search. Now, search async is an asynchronous method, a regular method that returns tasks. And if we look at what is the type of the observable now, it's kind of big, right? It's an I observable of task of I enumerable of string, right? Basically, you can think of tasks as a special kind of observables, because just like observables, they will have a value that will be computed and provided sometime in the future, or they can end with a failure or never end at all, right? It's just like an observable of a single value. Because this is an observable of single value, there's actually a way to convert a task into an observable, right? So now my observable is kind of an observable of observables. Not that it matter, but when you have something that is like enumerable of enumerables or observable of observable, you want to flatten it. And in this case, what I want to do is that each time I get an observable from the main observable, I want my application to concentrate on this one and switch the subscription into this one. So I have an observable that emits observables. My application will subscribe to the first one. But if another observable comes from the main observable, I want to switch to that one. So this switching is available to us using the, not surprisingly, switch operator. Not like switch case, but switch in the sense that I want to switch my subscription. Wonderful. All it's left now is just subscribe and do something with that value. So I'm adding a subscribe. And in this case, I'm saying that I got results. The results that I get is a collection of values. All I want to do is to go to my results collection. It's a list box on the screen. And put those values inside like this, right? And I can, of course, go and specify that if something bad happened, I want to handle it, right? This is on error. And if something completed, then I want to handle this kind of logic as well. Now, if I will run it, something bad will happen. Let me show you. So again, I'm running my application, hopefully. And I'm going to do a search. But now, instead of seeing the results, I get an exception, right? You can see an exception. The exception is saying that this is an invalid operation. The calling thread cannot access the object because a different thread owns it. Any idea why this is happening? Rod? OK. So, I think all of, them, all of you said the same thing. But basically, this is a UI application. You can't change a UI element unless you are on the same UI, on the same thread that owns it. And in this case, the search was returned on another thread. And I tried to set the value in my uh, control in, a, in the thread that is different than the UI thread. So this is bad. And I'm not going to solve this now. I'm going to show you the solution 
in my next slide. So basically, what we've done here is in 10 lines of code, more or less, created kind of an application that can contain all the logic that my feature needs. And I don't need to add all kind of event handling and spread the logic. And I don't need to handle the state. And I don't even need to handle the synchronization between things happening. This is all done by reactive extension. And this is one of the core things inside it. So visually, what we've done is something like this. We have an observable that emit values from the text box. Every time the user clicks something in the text box, we will get this kind of notification. We wanted to only handle values that are at least three characters long. So we added a where. And now I've created a new observable that do and push only those values that contains the amount of characters that I wanted. Then we've added a throttle. The throttle is like running a timer on the back end that counts the time that passes from each emission. And only if amount of time that I specified is, uh, is completed, only then the value is allowed to proceed. This is why we only get the REA, REAC, and REAC again, because as you can see, I entered this value twice. I only want to search the same value once, right? Unless there are other values between them. So I'm using the distinct until change that will eliminate the duplication of uh, ad adjacent values. Finally, I'm writing my search. And the search, as I said, is opening a task running in the background. And this task is kind of like an observable. So we can say that for two searches, we have two observables in my application. But I only want to subscribe to the last one of them. And this is what the switch does. The switch will only subscribe to the last one of those emissions and will pass the values forward, which then I can display on the screen. The power of those operators in Rx is there because of this composability that I mentioned before. And the composability is available to us because operators are written in this kind of uh, structure. We have the operator name, let's say operator, which works against some kind of an observable of some type and receive a few parameters. Might be functions, might be uh, values, whatever the operator does. But the operator itself returns a different observable that can have a different uh, type inside it. It doesn't have to be the same side. When you start writing your kind of extension method, those operators this way, you can achieve this kind of pipeline. Basically, you can just add an encapsulated logic for a specific task as an operator and just add it to the observables that you have. Another way to look at it is that you have your original source, the original observable, and every time you add an operator, you wrap it, and the operator wraps it in another observable. And the final observable is the one that the observer subscribes to. And when the original source is emitting a value, the value goes through all the wrappers until it gets to the subscriber, to the observer. And of course, the operator can decide not to let the value proceed. So let's talk about time and concurrency, because this is one of the things that reactive extension make, which is really beautiful. The, it allows us to abstract time. It allows us to parameterize concurrency. So first a question. Suppose I have this code in my application. I created an observable with a range of values, 1 to 5. And then I used the repeat operator. And I wrote it here that repeat just resubscribe the observer when the observable is completed. And then I subscribe to it. So every value will be written on the screen. Immediately after I've done that and subscribed, I dispose the subscription. And my question is, what will be printed on the screen? Any ideas? OK. So most developers, and we've seen it quite nicely here, falsely believe that the problem will immediately dispose the subscription and nothing will be written. And this happens because of the false assumptions that uh, observables are asynchronous and concurrent by default. And it's not like that. 
Basically, what I've written here in these lines of code is a beautiful way to say I have a loop that creates values, and then I wrap this loop in another loop that endlessly called the inner loop. I haven't went out of context into another thread. Nothing here says that. So basically, what, what, what we have here is like a loop that displays the same range of values over and over again indefinitely. Because developers believe, for some reason, that Observable will do their operation in another thread. But Reactive Extension is very careful. It will not introduce concurrency to the application unless you explicitly say so. And the way this is happening inside Reactive Extension is with the notion of schedulers. A scheduler is a unit that consists of a time, a clock with the current time, and some computation context, like a thread, like a task, like a different machine. And the scheduler can schedule work. So once I've given a work to the scheduler with a due time, when that due time will happen, it will run it on the computation context, which can be the same thread that I'm running on now, right? I got the abstraction. Schedulers all implement this interface, the iScheduler, which expose the now property that gives it the current time, and a bunch of overloads for scheduling work. I'm passing the function to run, and when I want to run it, with all kinds of states and things like that. So once I have this abstraction, I can start parameterizing concurrency in my operators. Before we use the throttle, the throttle behind the scene creates some kind of scheduling. It wants to schedule the time in which it can allow the value to proceed. Because I haven't specified the scheduler, it took this, the default one. But basically, we have an overload that allows me to specify where I want this kind of scheduling to take place. Perhaps I want it to be on the UI thread. And so the code that I've written before that used the throttle, I could have just written it like this and passing the new thread scheduler. Do the scheduling, do the timer on a new thread. Take this out of my UI thread so it won't block my application. We can also change the execution context explicitly along the pipeline. Go out of the current context, go out of the current thread to another thread and then come back and then go to another one. We do it with two operators. We have the observe on and the subscribe on. The difference is that observe on controls when I want, where I want to receive the values on which kind of execution context, perhaps on another thread or the UI thread. And the subscribe on uh, uh, controls the subscription time. When the observer subscribe, when or where it will take place. There are meaning to this in some kind of frameworks where you do the subscription and where you handle the notifications. And so to fix the problem we saw before, where my application said that I'm running in a different thread than the UI thread, all I had to do is just say, I want to observe on the dispatcher scheduler so I can receive the values on the dispatcher, which represent the UI thread. And I can do it in anywhere in my pipeline if it's meaningful to me. And I can go out and in to different contexts. Because this is something that we do a lot, instead of writing the full kind of implementation, we can just say observe on dispatcher, which will do behind the scenes what I've shown you before. With this, with this kind of implementation, I can now go and virtualize time, which is really helpful for, for testing. I can create my own kind of schedulers that virtualize the time that has passed. Because imagine with this kind of throttle mechanism in your application, which you probably use kind of a timer, how can you test it? How do you test time? But once you have this abstraction of scheduling with the iScheduler, you can create something that move from one value of time to another in an instance of time and see what goes inside your pipelines, which is really powerful because you can then go an extra mile and replay events inside your application and see what's happened. Really good for diagnosing bugs. So I hope that in this session I give you a glimpse of what reactive extension is and why it is really powerful and can take the headache from some things that you do today. Um, 
I talked about what are the building blocks, observables and observers, and how you can create them with different kind of operators. I haven't shown you everything that exists, of course, but I, I hope that it gives you a, a, a bit of an of a essence. Uh, we talked about queries with the operators and how we can abstract time with schedulers. I'd like to thank you for giving me the time and, and listening. Um, I really enjoy .next. I hope you enjoy it too. I put a few links that you can use, and of course the slide will be available to you after this session. Uh, you can go uh, uh, and uh, into the reactivex.io, which is the portal for all ReactiveX uh, um, libraries in all the languages, not only .NET. Uh, in the GitHub, you can go and file issues, and you can uh, go and search the code. Everything is open source. And we have channels on the Slack and on Gitter for all kinds of questions. If you want to ask me anything, feel free. My Twitter handle is written below. And again, thank you very much, and I'll be available in the discussion zone to more questions. <laughs>